Hello and welcome to Tarim Talks. I'm your host, Bob Rilchi. Today I'm with Mirshad Ghalib, a linguist PhD at the University of Indiana. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well too. Thank you very much. Mirshad, why don't you introduce yourself in a few sentences? Sure. My name is Mirshad Ghalib. Uh, I'm obviously from East Turkestan. I'm from the city of Korla, and I've been studying to get my PhD in linguistic anthropology for the past seven years. That's quite a long time. Uh, is there a specific topic in linguistic anthropology that you study? I originally started my um, academic journey with the thought of um, investigating mother tongue proficiency and its correlation to second language acquisition back home. Um, but Obviously, after 2017, I can't go back anymore. So I pivoted my project to uh, the language maintenance efforts, language ideology and language attitude of the diaspora community, or diaspora community in the U.S. Uh, so can you describe what language maintenance so, is? So um, I guess language maintenance is an academic term. Um, so... Communities like ours and also immigrant communities around the world, they, you know, if they go into a new environment where they don't speak the language, they would uh, encounter or be in a dilemma where they would have to either abandon their mother tongue or heritage language or, you know, like keep both of the language together or, um, you know, like, I guess those are the two scenarios, the two most co common scenarios. So when you're trying to keep your mother tongue or your heritage language, it's called language maintenance. And just like the term implies, it, there's a lot of work that, you know, that requires um, people to keep their mother tongue or heritage language. That's why we call it language maintenance. So what sparked your interest in the topic of language maintenance? Um, uh, it's so I've, since I was a kid, I have been very interested in, in learning languages. Um, it kind of, I went through different phases. Obviously, when I was a kid, not having any political awareness, I was really into learning Chinese from TV, school, and, you know, when I was a teenager in, like, middle school, I really started to see um, the colonial nature of our homeland and started resenting Chinese language and Chinese culture. But at the same time, there's this burning desire of me to acquire a new language um, at, even at that age. Um, so I started learning English. And um, when I was in college, I started to um, speak English better than my peers. And then um, I was in, in Urumqi in college. And in 2009, the riots happened. And after that, it was just a th series of um, harsher and harsher crackdown. And one of the first things that took took a hit was our language and you know like the certain there are certain parts of our culture that are you know being being promoted by the state but our language kind of as a whole was taking the biggest toll in my personal opinion at the time so I wanted to do something and at when I was in college I hear I would hear over and over again that Bilingual education is necessary. We were people need to study Chinese in order to join this greater economic prosperity with the China proper and whatnot. But in fact, starting pretty much from my generation or my uh, basically kids who grew up in the late 80s and early 90s, or even, let's say kids who were, who were growing up in the 90s where they started teaching Chinese and, you know, like the Chinese pop culture have really entered. We were home space with TV. And I, 
it it wasn't just me. People say, especially after I came to America, people say that, oh, you have a gift for language learning. What does that even mean? But at the same time, like n- not just me, everyone in my class, they were able to speak perfect Chinese. They were able to write. And, and still, like when I was graduating, there were no jobs. And they would tell it to my face that, you know, we don't hire Uyghur people. So my academic interest, I was very naively thinking that, oh, I'm going to, you know, prove that you don't have to lose your mother tongue to um, acquire another language. I'm going to do an academic study and then present to this to the Chinese state. So they would revise their policies, which are at the time, um, even though they're calling it bilingual education, it was more monolingual. It was more towards, you know, Chinese, you know, like the medium of education was Chinese, basically, except, you know, we were was being taught as a second language. And yeah, that, 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 that that's the reason why I basically, you know, got into this road of academia. I can definitely understand and see that path that kind of led you to studying this. Let me ask you, though, do you think that there are any unique challenges that are presented to the Uyghur diaspora uh, when it comes to language maintenance? Um, I, I would say yes and no. Um, on a macro level, challenges are very similar. Um, the diaspora communities all around the world, they face the challenge of being in a new environment and trying to, um, climb up the socioeconomic ladder using the norms of the new place. But the unique challenges that we face as we were people in, in America or in Europe or in Canada is that um, we, we are witnessing a genocide or a cultural genocide, how, however you want to define it, um, back home. And we can't do much. One of the things that we could do is to do language maintenance work here keep our mother tongue or our our heritage language here. So in case that, you know, it's very unlikely, I wouldn't say very, but it, it, it's kind of unlikely that Uyghur language would disappear from our homeland. But in case it does, it still survives here. Another question I had is, are there any differences and what are they between language maintenance back home in East Turkestan and for the Uyghur diaspora? Actually, I, I want to add something to your last question before I answer this question. Um, one of the, like one of the biggest differences with our community is a lot of people that we see in, in, or a lot of immigrant, other immigrant communities that we see, they come from, you know, like a certain place or a certain country, um, where their language or culture is guaranteed to continue like um, South Asians or Asian, Asian Americans or Asian, like other kinds of um, communities elsewhere. Um, They, they have their sovereign nation state and they come here. um, They don't necessarily care that much. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do care about language maintenance, but they don't, sometimes they don't care either because if my language were to continue in my homeland, I wouldn't feel the responsibility of continuing it here in the U.S. personally. But we we are in a very different situation. So I would say um, to, you know, like if, if someone, for example, Babur, if you're not feeling the responsibility, I would say, hey, maybe, maybe you should start feeling the responsibility since 2017, you know? But um, now let's let's move on to your um, next question. Uh, can do you mind asking that again? Um, yeah. So I was wondering uh, what the differences are, if any, between language maintenance in the diaspora and back home. 
Oh yeah, it's it's way more challenging in the diaspora. It's um, so the thing the the reason why I say it's it's kind of unlikely that we were language would disappear from our homeland is because we have a very stable and vibrant community, although it's being broken down right now. One of the mo- most important things for language, any language on this planet to survive is to have a community, to have a community that speaks it, that uses it on a daily basis. So um, it's a lot easier to speak Uyghur Jeb back home because everyone, everyone else does. But when you're in the diaspora, like you can create a home environment where you speak Uyghur Jeb, but once you're outside of your home, there's not going to be that environment unless you created, uh, you know, a, a little community full of Uyghur people that speaks Uyghur to each other. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Back in East Turkestan, there are active efforts to destroy the culture and the language. Like you were saying, there's a cultural genocide. Do you think that, uh, generationally speaking, that it will be easier to retain the language in the diaspora? Uh, if because there are no active efforts to erase the language and the culture in the diaspora, um, it's a, again it's a very hard question to answer because things are still developing. Um, I would say, in terms of freedom to do language maintenance, we have more freedom here in the diaspora because we live in free societies. Um, but at the same time, like I mentioned, it comes with its own challenges of lacking a language environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's move on a little bit from the idea of language maintenance. Uh, yeah. I'm curious. We are, Now we know c- kind of where you got started with yeah. linguistics and the idea of languages. What made you decide to follow through and acquire a PhD in linguistic anthropology. So, like I was saying earlier, um, so when I was in uni- university, like I, I studied from 2006 to 2010. Um, one of the things, um, not only in East Turkestan, but also in China that was really um, popular was to get your graduate degree or your PhD in in the US. And when you come back, um, you would receive, um, it it meant like prestige and like your research was respected, your data was respected because, I mean, it it shouldn't be just because you did it in the US, but it was the the reality. So I was like, okay, um, if this is the reality, I'm going to go study in the US and then prove that multilingualism is completely doable and it it is the way to go for Uyghur people because many of the problems that um that that were happening in East Turkestan was because of the assimilation efforts and it, it created you know um dissatisfaction among the Uyghur people. So I thought, you know, like I'm I'm going to get the highest degree possible and write a dissertation, write a book, and give it to the Chinese government and and see what they do with it. Because they are also, um, at the time, where where there were not a lot of anti-West sentiment, they were very much into studying English as well. So I, I thought, you know, like this is also a good opportunity to look at second language acquisition. It's also basically a million billion dollar in the industry around the world and uh, i thought you know like a lot of chinese students um struggle with learning english if if i can tap into some some sort of theory it would not only be beneficial to you know the way we're people but also chinese people at large is you know what i was naively thinking so uh you of course you went to the United States to kind of build up this reputation of academic credentials 
so that you can present your findings and uh, try to try to sway in some level what was happening back home. Yeah, that was the idea. Uh, do you think that had everything gone according to plan for you there, that they would have taken that into consideration? Um, I would say it's most likely no. Um, if if Chen Zhuanguo didn't happen, if Xi Jinping wasn't there, if things continued like pre-2016 or pre-2017 kind of way, I would say they might have given me a professorship somewhere in China proper and be like, oh, you did a good job. Come, come here. We'll, we'll take a look at your studies very carefully. And then, you know, like they would not do anything. Mm. Okay. They would have definitely shut me up that way. But, you know, like in, in reality, I don't think they would have done anything because their policy had been, you know, sl- slow assim- assimilation, gradual assimilation. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so, but back then when you were planning to do it, what were your, uh, what were your feelings towards your plan? Was it kind of skeptic skepticism that you would be able to pull it off, that they would listen? Or were you kind of, um, you know, eyes high, heart full? I, I was... You know, again, I, I, I called myself a, na- a naive person a couple of times earlier when I was talking about this this goal. Um, at the time, I wasn't thinking much. I was like, see, these Chinese people coming back from America, you know, taking up, you know, nice positions, powerful position within the government or outside of the government. Um, if, if I, you know, like did my academic studies in america when i come back i think they're going to give me a chance and, and and listen to me and that's that's what i was thinking yeah that that doesn't make sense uh so in terms of your other projects do you have anything else interesting that you've been working on or doing i know that um you're also a filmmaker from what i understand yeah I mean, I'm I'm more of an aspiring filmmaker. Um, I I I am working on like a few different things. Actually, I'm working on a memoir. I'm also working on a couple of different scripts. It try to you know like shoot short short films or start with that. I'm I'm and I'm also like having ideas of. Or actually, this this is more doable because I'm right now. I'm trying to focus on um, telling p- poetry visually, Uyghur poetry visually, um, not my own work, but you know, like adding the element of um, visuals into Uyghur poetry that is written by um, other poets. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? What brought that idea to you? Um, actually I was, um, talking to my good friend, Joshua Freeman. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He's quite famous among the Uyghur community because he speaks Uyghur just like one of us. And, uh, he's also a translator. He does a lot of, um, poetry, um, translation. Um, so one day we were just talking and like, we were admiring the works that we like. And then he was like, why don't you add like a visual element and like make it more relatable to the Western audience so we can, you know, like introduce this wonderful world of, um, we were poetry to, to Americans or, you know, like people in the West. Then I was like, oh, that is a very good idea. So since then, it's a very recent thing. We had this conversation like three weeks ago, um, maybe a month. But it, I've been trying to visualize the, you know, like we picked a very, very heavy poem. So I've been trying to vi- visualize it, everything in it. And um, it's it's not easy to come up with something that's not cliche but also relatable so yeah 
that honestly sounds pretty cool and uh, can't wait for that to come out uh, so that we can all take a look. Yeah. I mean, don't feel pressured or rushed. It, it yeah, is hard. Yeah, absolutely. Creative, yeah. creative pursuits take time, especially if you don't want to just throw in the towel or uh, yeah. rely on cliches, like you said. I mm -hmm. want to go back a little bit to your time in East Turkestan. So yeah, yeah, let's you go. Were, back. You were basically born and raised there. Yeah. Uh, how was that? It was amazing. I mean, if, if, I mean, um, I'm, I, I'd say I'm pretty, you know, um, assimilated into the U S society culture and everything. But if, if I can have an option to live back home or here, I'd, I'd take back home anytime. If of course, given that, you know, like there's no oppression like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, can you go into more depth about what? Absolutely. What you absolutely. Love so, so much about it. Yeah. Um, it's so it's there. There is so much to talk about, right? Um, when when you ask people, they talk about food. They talk about you know like culture. They talk about you know like um, what they miss. For me. I mean, so some people talk about this too, but for me, people, our community is is the biggest factor in this. Um, I, although like many people compl people complain about this, but I I don't. Um, so let me explain what I'm trying to say. So, um, the the tight knitted community that we have back home is kind of perfect, in to to me personally, right? Um, when I, when I say some people complain about it, they say, oh, you know, like people gossip, they don't know boundaries, you know, like everyone is in each other's business to me. That's okay. That's the, you know, like side effect of having such tight knitted community. But what I, what I, the, the good, good part of being, you know, so close to each other is you can talk to anyone about anything at any time. Well, not literally anything, but you can talk about most of the things to any, any of your friends at any time. You don't have to text them and schedule like, you know, like a meeting in like a few days. Like you can basically call them and be like, come out, you know, and also like we literally live like five minutes from each other. Like, sometimes walking distance, sometimes biking, sometimes, I guess, driving, but it doesn't matter. You're walking distance away from your friends and not to mention your neighbors, you know, like your, your neighbors, they're constantly sending food. They're constantly dropping in, just, you know, like dropping by your house unannounced for some tea, for some gossip. It doesn't matter for me. That's, that's just, you know, the best way to live. It's, um, it, even though like to from like a western stand standards like for an american if you go to their apartment without telling them that you're coming they would look at you i guarantee they would look at you like you just murdered their kids but like for us that's something normal like you 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 came yeah i'll i'll get some tea going and th there's some dried nuts and raisins We'll, we'll chat or, you know, we'll go out together to eat or do whatever. Like it, it's just like the, the easiness of socializing, the easiness of, of, um, being who you are and, you know, like just, just hanging out with, with your friends is yeah, that, that part just gets me every time. I, I mean, I can do that here with my absolute best friends but even if I have a very close friend, I I would have to be like, hey, you wanna you wanna get together soon, you know? And then they say, oh, how about this day? How about this weekend? You know, like you can't just like if it's if you guys are not absolute best friends, you can't just call them up and be like, yo, come out, we're gonna you know like do this or do that, like that that is just socially not acceptable, and I think it is wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Uh, you can, you can even see it in uh, small Uyghur communities in the diaspora that 
that element of closeness and like you were saying, people just dropping in uh, with unannounced and then you're hosting them and sometimes you just go over to there. It, it's certainly a different experience. It's, um, you don't get that in North America at the very least, at least not in Canada and the United States. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, this is going to sound like I'm a shrink, but tell me about your parents. What did they do and uh, how did they influence you to be who you are? Um, so my father was a banker. Um, my mother was a librarian. So I guess they both influenced greatly, um, especially my mom. When I was a kid, she forced me to read a lot. And uh, at first I wasn't into reading. And then like slowly, I guess reading like was a habit that I built, um, which is solely, you know, attribute, well, contribute attributed to my mom is that the word that i'm anyways yeah. <laughs> because of my mom i got into reading when i was a kid and then my dad was more um um encouraging of i don't know like school different subjects like natural science i was uh, really into physics in school he was really encouraging of it i was really also really into um, computers. He was like extremely encouraging of it. Um, I built my first computer with him in, uh, I believe it was in the year 2000. And it, it was a very new thing for we were, you know, communities to have computers, but my father just decided one day we're going to go buy parts and build it together. Um, he, it helped that he was working in the computer department. He was head of the computer department of the, um, of the bank that he was working for. So he already had some knowledge and, um, yeah. And, and then also like my father, my mother was always very careful, but my father, while being careful, but he, he would, my, I, I'd say my, he was responsible for my political awakening, to, so to speak. Um, he would talk about sensitive topics at our house with his friends, with his absolute best friends, of course. And, uh, um, I would be there sometimes listening, you know, like after the majority of the conversation is done, he would look at me and be like, you've listened enough or don't listen anymore. Go back into your room or go play. You know, like sometimes when I look back, I, I wonder if he was like intentionally making me listen to some of the sensitive things that he, they were talking about. And, uh, and also like he, he was very straightforward. Um, I think I definitely got it from him. I don't have a filter when I'm talking to people. Um, it certainly upsets people, you know, like people who don't know me well. But um, it, it, I, I was um, aware that my father got into trouble even with his bosses, Han Chinese bo bosses, um, when I was a kid regularly just because he was outspoken and um, wasn't, you know, like ass kissing and, and, and like, you know, wasn't as um, PC or, you know, like wasn't as accommodating um, as, you know, like the Chinese or even as, as other Uyghurs. So um, I, um, I think his actions or the actions that I've seen or I, I've heard had lots of influence on me. And uh, um, my mom, maybe because of that, she tried to work uh, on my manners more when I was a kid. Um, yeah, she would say, oh, don't, don't say such a thing. You know, like don't say certain things in front of certain people. You know, like in front of certain people, act certain way. 
you know, and then um, she would try to teach me like, you know, like basic mannerism, which I already knew and was like, mom, I know, but she was like insisting like certain things. And yeah, it, it, I, they, they definitely have, have had like a, a great, you know, like shaping of my personality. Yeah. I mean, it, who your parents are really do influence um, the kind of person you are. And I, the, for the brief time I've known you, I know that you're a very outspoken person who says what you think. And you just telling me the story kind of reinforces that, you know, um, about what, how your father was and what you picked up from him. Yeah. So I, it kind of, it kind of clicks for me there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, who is someone that you admire and, uh, um, and why? Uh, I, I think I'd, I have to say my father um, because n it, he was like, he was, the, the thing is he passed away in, in 2008. Oh, I'm um, sorry to hear that. Yeah, no worries. Um, I try to remember the things that he tried to teach me from little things, you know, like the house maintenance projects from basically from house maintenance projects to moral lessons in life. Every time when I think about his words, as I get older, I'm like, oh, he was so right. Like he just had this wisdom that um, I, I, I'm still trying to tap into. I'm, I'm still trying to um, remember. But um, when I think about him, it's it's like, I guess when I speak about him like this, he sounds like a mentor, but at the same time, it was, it was, he was also a very good father. He was full of dad jokes. He was, you know, like teasing us all the time. And while, you know, being, when he was being serious, he was very serious. So like it, 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 I always try to, you know, like live like my father because I admire him when I was a kid, I still admire him after growing up. Yeah. Um, what is, what is your uh, vision for the future? What do you look forward to and what do you want to accomplish? Uh, for myself, vision for myself. Yeah. For yourself. Um, I've short term short short term vision is to finish my PhD, <laughs> finish writing this beast of a dissertation. Um, long term vision is to you know. I don't know. I actually think about a lot of different things. That's um, I just like don't have one single vision. You know, like I can imagine myself going into academia and becoming a professor. Or I can imagine myself, you know, like doing some NGO stuff and contributing to our diaspora community, especially with the language. I, yeah, I, I have different visions, of course, and who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, that's fair. Nothing is defined per se, but... Yeah, yeah. I actually, one of the things that I actually think about a lot is um, when I was growing up, I, I don't know if you guys who grew up in, in the West, who grew up in North, North America have watched as much anime, but watching anime was a, was a thing. They were dubbed in Chinese when I was growing up, and it helped me actually learn a lot of Chinese. So at one point, um, I wrote a paper about this, and then I, I basically tried to explore the, the possibilities of dubbing popular culture from dominant culture into, you know, like endangered language, th these cultures with, with endangered languages. And when I say 
you know, having an NGO and contributing to our community, that's something I possibly could do, you know, um, to basically have an NGO that helps to create this media, popular media, media taking popular media content from, you know, the dominant languages and dub them or bring them into our our homes so i think um of course um i i would try to do everything legally to get the copyrights unlike some of some of the already existing you know like sites where they just do it without getting the copyrights and they get flagged and then they disappear you know like there's no consistency um and also a lot of people i actually want to tie this into another thing a lot of people talk about oh how we don't have a great um program that is designed to do language maintenance or like teach the kids we were like that's why i'm waiting that's why i'm not teaching my kids we were which is to me it kind of preposterous because you can, without any kind of program, you can still create a language environment at your home and, you know, still bring up your kids or, you know, like have your kids bilingual. And also speaking of um, the benef- benefits of growing up bilingual is tremendous. It's also like cognitively speaking, it adds to your cognitive abilities and also, it increases your meta metalinguistic knowledge. So it means when you're picking up a third language or a fourth language, it becomes easier. So there are a lot of benefits of, um, you know, basically multilingual household or like, you know, um, because the thing is you can, I think people should keep their household language Uyghurche what, because the media, outside school, everything else is in English for North America, at least for the US and Canada. So you don't need to take care of that part of the equation because, you know, the kid is going to learn once he or she steps out of the house. So what you need to do is create a home language environment at at home inside the household, put your foot down and say, hey, this is the language that we're speaking at home. You're not speaking anything else. And at first, you know, there, there, there's, of course, not at first, always going to be resistance, rules going to be broken all the time. But, you know, the benefit that comes with bilingualism or, or multilingualism, like outweighs like anything else, like by too much. So every time when I hear someone is not taking care of we were with their, you know, newborn, it just kind of pains me. And it, not to go off on t- on a tangent, but like, you know, if a lot of people also say this is what I see on the we were internet that oh, the the people in Israel they recovered their language after, you know, like thousands of years they they're speaking hebrew now and uh, to, to them i would say that's one in literally thousands there are they're basically there's one language dying every other week and the languages that we can bring back very little so you can't just take one example and say look they did it we can do it again later too Keep in mind that the Israelis, Jewish people, like, you know, like globally speaking, they do have a lot of like, not only capital, but also cult, economic capital, but also cultural capital. So there, you know, there is going to be less difficulties for them to do certain things. For us down the road, I think it's going to be almost impossible. So for those people who say, oh, we can do it later, later, you know, like when we have, when we're strong or when we're have, when we have the opportunity, I would say, no, you probably can't. It's going to be very difficult. So, um, I would do the difficult thing now, 
um, to keep our language. Oh, are there any other uh, things that we can do as a whole to preserve our language and identity? Um, I, that's a tough question because if I had the answer to that question, I would become very famous at a very <laughs> big academic institution and tackling, um, the problems of language endangerment. Okay. Um, yeah, but I mean, I definitely have read what people have said. One thing that I don't ag agree with academia one thing that comes with, you know, like the paper that I mentioned, the the NGO idea is is because what what they're doing in academia, especially traditionally, doesn't work. What they do is, oh, let's let's rec record the language, like let's document it, let's document document the grammar. Okay, we have that in Uyghur. We actually have a pretty complete documentation, not only in Uyghur but also in other languages too. But that doesn't stop a language from dying. So many of the Native American languages in North America have died, but the linguists have tackled it in like, I don't know, mid like 1950s or, or something. But like it, it was when it's dying, they said, oh, let's, let's, do document. Let's let's translate the grammar. Let's translate this folklore. Let's do this. Let's do that. None of it worked. Literally, none of it worked. They died. So many languages, so many Native American languages died. Of course, there is. We have to talk about the power imbalance between the two communities when we're talking about you know like language shift, language endangerment. But at the same time. The academic world, especially linguists, should you know like move on from um, documenting the grammar because that's not going to help the community. What we need to do is engaging with the youth, engaging with the art community, engaging with you know coming up with something popular, something that would um, you know like the young people. They're the most important people in, in terms of battling language endangerment so how do we capture their attention how do we get them to participate in this fight that's the most important thing and you can't do it with translating grammar or translating some some folklore even though sometimes folklore could be very very cool but like it's not going to capture young people's attention yeah and um it just sounds like to me if from what you're saying is that mere preservation of a language is not enough to keep it around. It needs to, it, it's like something that is actually alive. You need to continue to feed it and water yeah. it and nurture it in order yeah, for absolutely. it to stay alive and grow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the thing is um, there are examples of other successful cases besides the, the state of Israel. There's also Welsh. Welsh oh, was on the brink of extinction. They brought Welsh back to a certain degree of success. Um, one of the things that they did was actually closely tied to what I just mentioned. Um, they took a lot of popular media especially popular songs and other things they translated into Welsh and they sang them in Welsh and the young people, especially who consume the, these popular songs, they started singing in Welsh, you know, like this is a great song. It, it was sang in Welsh and I'm learning the lyrics, you know, like that generates interest that generates, you know, like enthusiasm that, uh, a translation of grammar or like some folklore translation cannot, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, there, this is something that we need to, you know, constantly think about as we, you know, think more about how are we going to continue our language? How are we continue or how are we going to continue our culture? Um, because yeah, like, like we were just saying it, it needs constant work. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
And because this is this is a related question to what you're talking about, and it also branches out into other aspects of your life, I was wondering how do you think your Uyghur identity has influenced the way that you look at your work and the way you look at life? Um, of course, um, as anthropologists, we always assume that we have, you know, like a view from somewhere. There's no view from nowhere, basically. A lot of like academics like to talk about objectivity, this and that. We just say, you know, like there's no objectivity. We come from a certain place. And I very much subscribe to that notion. I look at things from a very colored lens, a lens, a lens of being an Uyghur. So um, I, it, this made me relate to a lot of the things that the researchers or researchers that were doing in their research. Keep in mind that these, some of the res- the majority of the researchers that I've met mentioned they're coming in from outside into a different community or immigrant community or diaspora community they're trying to understand their language maintenance habits they're trying to research their language there are certain things i don't think they're going to capture well there's certain things that they're not going to see they're at least the urgency that i feel they're not going to have it so um being in Uyghur and seeing language shift, you know, growing up with this, you know, all kinds of assimilation efforts kind of just made me see the urgency of um, mother town maintenance. And um, that's at least how it influences me in academia. Um, but um, I guess as a Uyghur, in the Western world, it, I, I don't know. Like I, I definitely, like I. First of all, I don't subscribe to the bipartisan identity thing that in America has because, like, it's. I mean, obviously, I'm. I consider myself very progressive. Um, I'm very much on the left of pretty much everyone, um, but at the same time, I don't want to. Sub- subscribe myself to any kind of political group because I just don't feel um, I just don't feel connected as as much and uh, it it's it also like it I, I don't know if this is particularly because I'm Uyghur but it's I just I just even though I'm on the very very left I don't like see myself identifying with neither group but sometimes that being said i see the argument of people on the right as well so you know like that's that's another element and also um being an Uyghur, i guess this is very related um to what just happened with george floyd um i i'm not only outraged i'm upset um it happened with eric garner it happened with George Floyd. Every time I like, the first time I saw those two, the video, I, I cried. I, I I couldn't control myself. Um, I I couldn't help myself think about what our people were going through, what you know, African Americans going th- are going through in this country. You know, like there's the systematic oppression is not the same but like it the the similar things are how brutal the oppression can be so it, it i was just uncontrollably bawling and uh i th- i think that's i i don't know if other people cried when they saw that video but or saw those video videos but um i think the the we were identity have certainly played a role in how connected I feel with the oppression that the African American community feels. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah, that's, that's basically how I feel as an Uyghur in America. Yeah. I mean, it 
it really is a subjective experience. So I can't, I can't tell you if you um, answered the question right or wrong. I think you did answer my question though. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, and that's what I just, wanted to make sure. And just to add some context for people who may not know, um, George Floyd and Eric Garner were two black men who were killed by police uh, after repeatedly saying that they couldn't breathe uh, and are usually held up as the symbols uh, and martyrs of police oppression and racism against uh, black people in America. Uh, did I get that right? I think yes, that's what well said, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, for you, what does it mean to be Uyghur? I, I know um, we talked a little bit about how your identity plays into your work and your life, but uh, as a more far-reaching concept, what does it mean for you to be Uyghur? So I was, after I started started my academic journey, or even before that, I, I was fairly obsessed with the notion of identity for a while. But uh, my interest didn't stop, but I my research interest or like my academic interest kind of pivoted because I, I just realized at some point that identity is whatever you want it to be. It I know it sounds very vague and it doesn't answer anything, but um, for example, I was talking about Joshua Freeman earlier, right? My, my friend who I described as someone who speaks Uyghur as good as any Uyghur, any of us. Um, if he wanted to describe himself as Uyghur, if he wanted to take up the Uyghur identity, I would say, yeah, go for it. I wouldn't object it at all. And it's, it, I guess it, it, I'm trying to say that identity is a very human construct. It's very arbitrary. Um, but at the same time, it's so significant to us. Um, to me, um, identity, like a person's identity, or to write, to have the right to identify themselves as whatever they want should be a right. Um, for example, I guess I'm still thinking about this in, in, in the Uyghur sense, right? Chinese people like to say, oh, you're Chinese. And a lot of even Uyghur people, when, they, when they're when they asked, where are you from? They often say, I'm Chinese. Or they sometimes they say, I'm Turkish. To be honest, I don't feel like I'm neither. I'm definitely not Chinese. I'm maybe, I'm, I'm a Turk, culturally and maybe genetically too. I don't. I don't know what it means, but I. I can be in the category of, of a Turk, but at the same time, like I am going to tell everyone I'm Uyghur. If they want an explanation, I'll explain it. If they get bored, they get bored. If they're interested, I'll explain more. So that has been my understanding of identity and how I look at it. And, you know, like I said, it's, it's very fluid, but at the same time, it comes with a lot of emotional baggage. And I, while I understand the arbitrary nature of it, I can't separate myself, separate my emotions from it. I guess that's, that's the, that's my answer. Yeah. And I think you touched on something that maybe every Uyghur in the diaspora has kind of experienced is that. When people ask, oh, where are you from? And you're stuck with this decision. Are you going to tell them that you're Uyghur? And then naturally it goes into this five to 10 minute long tangent about where you're from, what it is. Yes, it's a country. No, I'm not Chinese. Uh, yes, it's part of China now, stuff like that. Or do you just go for the simple, simple answer? You know, I'm yeah. Oh, I'm Turkish. I'm a Turk. And for the longest time, uh, when people asked me that question, I would just say, oh, I'm Turkish as a way to, you know, deflect the question, kind of mm -hmm. avoid having to answer all that stuff because I really didn't want to get into it. And since about 2015, that's when I became more comfortable 
openly expressing that, yes, I'm Uyghur and not being afraid to get into that long explanation and uh, discussion about who, what are the Uyghurs and where am I from and stuff like that. It's because it's now more fixed as a part of my identity. Yeah, not to bring everything back to my academic research or interest again, but one of the things that I agree with academia in terms of language endangerment is to install a sense of pride into the younger generation because a lot of the younger, I don't know if this is the same for you, but you can definitely tell me how you felt when you were growing up. But when you were talking about the heritage language or the mother tongue, the younger generation often associated the language or the culture with, you know, like something old, archaic that doesn't belong in in the contemporary world. That's why they're, you know, like trying to stay away from it even. And uh, that, that was one of the biggest obstacles that academia had in terms of language revitalization or language maintenance efforts. Um, But um, I guess to, to do that, um, among our community is to ask a question from ourselves, like how do we install a sense of pride to the younger generation? Like how do they, like how, how do we let them have the trans- transition that you had, you know, like to say, oh, I'm, I'm Uyghur, from the, now on, I'm going to tell everyone that I'm Uyghur proudly. Or maybe you, you were just, it's, maybe it's not about pride, maybe like it's about going through the, the inconvenient truth of explaining, ha- having a five minute long explanation, you know, like I guess having them to be, how to get them to be less lazy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. For me, I would say it, it might've been a mix of both. Um, mm. Just not wanting to deal with the situation, but also, not really feeling like this is something that I, I want to have to explain. Um, or is there anything that I should have asked you, but I didn't? Things that you want to talk about, but I didn't give you the time for? Well, I, I thought we could have talked about language longer at the beginning, but you know, like I pivoted things back to where I wanted to talk about, you know, like how some Uyghur people are delusional thinking that we can recover our language or, you know, some people are scared of um, speaking Uyghur to their kids thinking they wouldn't learn Uyghur while in fact growing up my multilingual or bilingual is way more beneficial. Um, You know, like just basically things like that I thought we could have talked more at the beginning, but we we eventually did. So I guess there's not much else unless you have a burning, lingering question. Um, There's nothing that I can think of anymore. I think we went through a pretty wide variety of topics, starting with your work and uh, what what you think about being Uyghur, the Uyghur identity. Um, Where can people reach you, Mershad? Instagram is probably the easiest way to find me. Um, okay, and uh, I can just put your uh, username, if you're comfortable, in the notes for the episode. Sure. That's awesome. A- and it's Mershad13? Yeah, it's Mershad13. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to come on the show. Uh, it was really great to be able to meet you, talk to you, and learn more about you. Yeah, same. Uh, Nice to meet you too. Although we talked about myself for the past hour, I hope, you know, we can have a chance to talk about you as well. Yeah, maybe maybe next time you'll interview me for a podcast. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, I don't have a podcast, so maybe we're going to have to switch (laughs) up roles, you know, like, I'm going to have to be the host, you're going to have to be the next Tarn podcast. Oh, yeah. Podcast. That would be an interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. Um, yeah, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I hope yeah, you have thanks a for having me. rest of your day. Yeah, I, I hope this, you know, like this podcast is as informal to the new and old parents of our community as I think it is, you know, like 
there's so much information in my head, but it's just hard to tell it in a coherent and useful way. But I hope I did my best. I think you did. And you conveyed a lot of information and the way you presented it was understandable and relatable. Uh, and I appreciate that you broke down the academic terms that you use, language maintenance, stuff like that, into uh, layman's terms that everyone can understand. Thanks for listening to Time Talks. Make sure you check out thetaramnetwork.com. Thetaramnetwork.com is the place to be for the Uyghur diaspora in order to learn the language, uh, meet new people, and more. We're actually hosting seminars. One of them is this Sunday with Muqaddas Majid, and she's hosting it on music and the anthropology of it. She was actually a guest on our podcast a few episodes back, so make sure you check that out as well if you want to learn more about what she does.